If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, we're still in the book of First Peter. If you don't know where that's at, go to the very back of your Bible and work your way back to the left, and you will run into Second Peter, and right before Second Peter is First Peter, and today the text that we're looking at is First Peter chapter 4, verses 7 all the way through 11. Have you ever had to keep yourself busy because you were waiting on something to come to pass? Maybe you were in the airport and for some reason your flight was delayed and you decided to read a book or you decided to take a walk and to look at all of the shops that were inside of the airport. Maybe you were at the doctor or you were in a dentist's appointment and for some reason your doctor or your dentist was running a little bit behind and you decided in, in order to pass the time that you will read every single magazine in the office. Maybe you were stuck inside because of the snow or because of the ice and you decided that in order to pass the time that you were going to gather up your family all together and you were going to play some board games or maybe you decided to take a long nap. Whenever Colson was younger, in order to help him pass the time, we would often give him our phones. And we would often get our phones back with thousands upon thousands of pictures just like this. But you know what? It worked, all right? It worked. Jude, whenever we lived... Well, Jude looked back at me, but whenever... Um, Whenever we lived in the Owasso area, we, my wife would go shopping at Target. And in order to get Jude to pass the time whenever my wife was in Target, the very first thing she would do is stop and get him a big old icy and a big old bag of popcorn. And you know what? It helped her to pass the time. Worked really, really well. And yes, we do bribe our kids from time to time. And you know what? The exact same thing works for Macy. If I'm going to Lowe's or something like that, the first thing that I'm going to do is buy her a big Brahm shake and a sucker and you know what it helps me to do? It helps us to pass the time at least for 20 or 30 minutes. Whenever Jude is in the car, this is how our son Jude passes the time. <laughs> Those are the many positions of um, Jude's napping. Jude has the spiritual gift of napping. He does it very, very well, as you can tell. And those are five pictures of about a thousand that I took of him napping one day in the car. And in today's text, Peter is telling believers how to pass the time for the glory of God while they are waiting for the return of Christ. Look at the text with me. Look at verse 7. He says this in the text. He says, The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. And here Peter is calling on believers to understand the shortness of, of time. You see, up to this point in history, Christ had been prophesied about in the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ, he came, and he lived, and he died, and he was resurrected from the grave, and then Christ, he, he commissioned believers to go into all the world and to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and then Jesus, he ascended into heaven, then the church was established, and the next event on the prophetic calendar is the return of Christ. And because of this, we are living in the last days. You see, at any moment, we could either meet Christ by his return or by death. But either way, what Peter is saying here is that prophetically, the end of all things is at hand. There was a very popular country song in the early 2000s called Live Like You Were Dying by Tim McGraw. Anybody ever heard that song? Any, all right. Anybody want to sing that song for us today? Any, any show of hands? No show of hands today? But live like you were dying. In the first part of the lyrics say this, he said, I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me and a moment came that stopped me on a dime. I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays, talking about the options and talking about sweet time. I asked him when it sank in that this might really be the, really be the real end. 
How's it hit you when you get that kind of news? He said, man, what'd you do? Remember the chorus? He said, I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. And I loved deeper. I spoke sweeter and I gave forgiveness that I've been denying. And he said, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you were dying. I think I've, I've made a confession to you before, but I just love country music, right? Anybody else like country music? There are some just great, great country songs out there that really tell biblical truths. You see, this is a song that tells a story about a man who came to understand that he didn't have much time left on the earth. Why? Because of a terminal diagnosis. And the song says that he went and he lived his life to the fullest with the time that he had left. And here, Peter is telling believers, he is saying, compared to eternity and Christ's imminent return, because it is the next event on the prophetic calendar, Peter is saying to believers, there isn't much time left. He is saying that, that life could come to a close at any moment. That's why he says, the end of all things is near. And then look at what he says in the rest of verse 7. He says, therefore, therefore, why, why, why are you saying this? Well, therefore, because the end of all things is at hand, he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. He says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So, in other words, Peter is saying, now that you know that, that Christ is going to return, he is saying, be sane and think realistically about the future and pray. And pray, he, he's saying here, he's saying, don't, don't lose it. No, don't flip out. Don't go crazy. Don't, don't lose your heads. Don't act irrationally. And he says, don't do these things. Why? He says, for the sake of your prayers. And this is the idea of depending on God in prayer with the time that one has left. One commentator writes, the realization that God is bringing history to a close should provoke believers to depend on him. And this dependence is manifested in prayer. For in prayer, believers recognize that any good that occurs in this world is due to God's grace. Today, our son Colson, he turns 12 years old. And uh, we're so proud of Colson. We're so proud of who he is and who he's becoming and all that God is doing in his life. But can I just be honest with you about something? As, as I see my, my children, you know, get a little bit older every, every single year, can I just be honest with you about something? And I think that many of you would say the exact same thing, that I am really concerned about the world that my son is heading into. I think that many of you would say the exact same thing. I, I'm concerned about the world that my son is heading into, and and all of my children, and I think that you would say the same thing about your children, and, and your grandchildren, and, and your nieces, and, and your nephews, and there are times where, I'll just be honest with you, that it worries me, it bothers me in such a great deal, and, and I found myself in, in my concerns, and in, in, my, in my worrying about this, God reminding me over and over, Caleb, don't worry about it, don't worry about it, don't, 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 um, don't lose it. Don't, don't flip out. Don't, don't take your son and, and hide him away. What God just keeps reminding me of is this. Caleb, just pray. Just pray. I've got this. I'm in control. I am in charge. I've got this. And in a sense, that's what Peter is saying here. Christ is getting ready to return. He can return at any moment. Don't, don't lose it. Don't flip out. Don't let that scare you. As a matter of fact, that is a good thing. At any moment, we could meet the Son of God face to face. How incredible would that be? So Peter is saying, instead, for the sake of your prayers, don't worry about it. Instead, pray. I love what John Piper says about prayer. He says, prayer is the open admission that without Christ we can do nothing. Charles Spurgeon says, the power of prayer can never be overrated. If a man can but pray, he can do anything. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face to God. Alastair Begg says, prayer is an acknowledgement that our need of God's help is not partial, but 
total. Again, so Peter is saying again, the end of all things is near. Don't barricade yourself in your home. Don't isolate yourself from the world. Don't lose control. Be sane. Think with a clear head. Think realistically and pray and depend on God. See, church family, knowing that the end is near should cause us to make every decision we make based on eternity. You see, Moses, he knew that the time was short. And this is the prayer that Moses prayed in Psalm chapter 90. Moses said, So teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. And then he goes on to pray in verse 17. And he's really praying this because he's coming to understand that, that life is short. That life really is short compared to eternity. So he goes on to pray because time is short, because days, the days are numbered, he says at the very end to close out this prayer in Psalm 90. He says, therefore let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us. With the time that we have left, because our days are numbered, establish the work of our hands, yes, establish the work of our hands. So Peter says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded. Don't lose it, pray. And then he says this, here's how we can continue to pass the time for the glory of God. He says in verse 8, keep on loving each other. Keep on loving each other. Look at verse 8. He says, above all, he says, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. We need to understand that in these next few verses, and it will make total sense to us as we read, but in these next few verses, Peter is specifically talking to believers. He is specifically talking to the church and how believers should relate to each other. And I think if Peter had to pick one of these things for us to make sure that we do, it would be this one. It would be to love each other earnestly. That's why he says, above all. Above all. He says, keep loving one another because love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, he's, he's saying to believers, he is saying to the church, love each other and overlook each other's offenses. Love each other and overlook each other's mistakes. Love each other and overlook each other's imperfections. Our son Jude, he is very conscientious about his, his physical health. He's always asking me, Daddy, what can I do to stay in shape? I'm like, Jude, you're like skin and bone, man. Da Daddy, um, what, what should I be eating right now? What kind, of, what kind of food should I be eating? I'm like, peanut butter and jelly, corn dogs, you know, what, what most seven-year-olds eat. And he's always asking me this question as well. Daddy, what can I do to get a six-pack? I'm like, Jude, you are, you are related to me. You will never have a six-pack, man. I am so sorry. But this is what Brittany and I continually tell Jude. We always tell him this whenever he asks these questions. We say, Jude, you are, you are seven years old. You're getting ready to be eight years old. And the greatest thing that you can do for your health is to go outside and to be a kid and to play. That's the greatest thing that you can do for your health. And not, not to worry about it. You see, church family, the most important thing that Christians can do for each other is to love each other. It's the most important thing that we can do for each other. It's to love each other and to overlook each other's faults and to overlook each other's imperfections. You see, the Bible tells us this, and it makes it very clear, that love for others is the defining mark of a Christian. Love for others is the defining mark of a Christian. Remember that great text that Paul said, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels that have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have 
And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then he says these great words that we've all read. Maybe many of you have these on, a, on your wall somewhere. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and then he says essentially the same thing that Peter says, but the greatest of these is love. Peter says the exact same thing, above all, love. I wonder where they got this from. I believe they got it from Jesus. Jesus himself said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Remember, he's talking to believers. He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the church. He's talking to us. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And then Peter, he goes on, he, and he gives us practical ways that Christians can love each other and we can do this by helping each other without complaint we can love each other by helping each other without complaint look at what peter says in the beginning of verse 9 he says show hospitality to one another without grumbling show hospitality to one another without grumbling you see in peter's time this would have meant welcome people into your homes Help them, provide for them, feed them without complaining about it. And for us, it may look more like pr practically helping a fellow believer out without grumbling about it. I read this story here recently. It said this, Puritan John Howe briefly served as a chaplain to Oliver Cromwell. During this time, he was often approached for assistance by others, and he never refused any worthy request. One day Cromwell said to him, Mr. Howe, you have asked favors for everybody except yourself. Pray, when does your turn come? To which Howe replied, my turn, my Lord protector, is always come when I can serve another. You see, what Peter is saying here is that Christians, they don't grumble. Christians don't gripe. Christians don't complain, especially when they are called to help their brothers and sisters in Christ, even if it's one's fault because of a mistake that they made and that they need help. We still should not complain about serving a brother or sister in Christ or helping someone in need. Again, Christians are called to help their brother or sister in Christ without complaining about it. And that is how Peter says that we can practically show love to each other. Paul said that, the same thing. He said, do all things without grumbling or disputing. He says that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So he says, this is how Christians can practically show love to one another by helping each other without grumbling about it, by helping another person without complaining about it. And here are more practical ways that Christians can show love to each other by serving others with the spiritual gifts that God has given them. By serving others with the spiritual gifts that God has given them. Look at the beginning of verse 10. Well, the entire verse of verse 10. Peter says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Remember, he's talking to believers. He's talking to the church. As each one has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And what is the gift that Peter is talking about? Well, here, Peter is talking about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. You see, everyone who is a follower of Christ, everyone who is trusted in Christ for salvation, has been, been given gifts of the Spirit. If you'd like to read more about the gifts of the Spirit, I would encourage you to go to Romans chapter 12 and to read about the gifts of the Spirit. But everyone who is a follower of Christ has been given gifts of the Spirit. 
And those gifts of the Spirit that have been given to followers of Christ are to be used for, for serving fellow believers in the church. That's what Peter's talking about here. Look at verse 11. He says this. He says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. He's still, still talking about using your spiritual gifts to serve your brother and sister in Christ. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Verse, uh, the next part of verse 11. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. You see, all spiritual gifts are for serving and edifying other people. And spiritual gifts usually fall into two different categories. They fall into speaking gifts and serving gifts. That's what Peter's talking about. Usually our spiritual gifts fall in line of speaking gifts and also serving gifts. Speaking gifts are gifts like the ability to teach, the ability to preach. It could be things like this. You have this amazing ability to encourage other people. I've experienced that in this church. Many of you have the gift of encouragement. You have this ability to be able to speak into other people's lives and to leave them feeling just on top of the world because of the way you are able to encourage them. It's gifts like exhortation. Practically, it would look like this, teaching a Sunday school class or teaching a class maybe at like vacation Bible school or something like children's church or men's Bible study or a women's Bible study. Also practically, it's like this. It's in encouraging your brother or sister in Christ who is going through a difficult time. You see, there are people in our church that have been given those gifts. You have this ability to go up to somebody and by your words to be able to just change their day, to change the course of their day, to change the course of their life. God has gifted you with that ability, with that speaking ability. Many of you have this ability to be able to comfort someone by the words that you speak. And those gifts are from God. God has gifted you with those gifts. So we see speaking gifts that Peter is talking about. We also see serving gifts. And again, many of you, so many of you have these gifts that have been given from God to you. These are gifts like giving, the spiritual gift of leadership, being able to lead others, the, the spiritual gift of um, you have this ability to show mercy. When, when others want to, want to condemn, you have this ability to step in and to see the other side and this idea of mercy that you can show to others. So many of you, you have this serving gift of, of helping, and, and serving gifts are, are gifts that are, that are usually behind the scene. Get things that, that people really don't see so often, and you have these gifts. And we, all, we also see this, that oftentimes people can have both. People have the ability to have these, these speaking types of gifts. They also have this ability to have these serving types of gifts as well. But we need to understand that these gifts that have been given to us by God are to be used. They're to be used by us to serve each other in the body of Christ. They're to be used to serve each other for the glory of God. Again, look at verse 11 with me. He says, whoever speaks, whoever has that, that ability, that, that speaking type of gift, as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves, who has the serving type of gifts, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In other words, if someone has this the speaking spiritual gift, they are to speak the word of God and, and not their own words. They are to comfort others with the words of God. If, if one has a serving gift, again, that's the, the gift that's more behind the scenes. They are to serve by the, the strength that God gives. They are to serve by the strength that God supplies. Why? That way, whenever the believer is using these gifts that God has given them, all of this points back to God. It points back to Him. It points back to His glory. It points back to His fame. I love seeing my, my children play with the gifts that I've gotten. And if, if I buy them a birthday gift or, or a Christmas gift, and you've experienced this as well, whenever you give someone a gift, 
One of the greatest gifts that you can receive back in return is to see that person loving that gift and, and playing with that gift and, and enjoying that gift and using that gift. And the exact same thing is true for God. You see, God loves to see you and I serve his bride, the church, by using the gifts, the spiritual gifts that he has given us. He loves to see us use them. You see, this church is full of Bible teachers. This church is full of people who have this amazing ability to encourage others. This church is full of people who have the ability to comfort others with their words. This church is, is full of people who are givers. This church is full of people who are leaders, people who are wonderful administrators, people who are servants, people who are helpers behind the scenes, so many people who do so many things that we often don't even see, but you're using your gifts for the glory of God. This church is full of people who have this ability to show kindness, who have this just innate and uncanny ability to show mercy. You see, the church functions best when everyone is using their spiritual gifts to serve their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and also to serve the world that is around them. And you might be asking yourself this question, well, how does one come to understand and to use their spiritual gifts? Well, one might say, well, just take a spiritual gifts test. And there's a lot of spiritual gifts tests that are out there, and some of those tests are, are somewhat accurate, some are accurate, some are, are not so accurate. And it's not necessarily a, a bad thing to take a spiritual gifts test, but the best way to discover our spiritual gifts are to start by helping others. We can, we can discover our spiritual gifts by, by serving others. We can dis discover our spiritual gifts by simply doing what Peter is calling us to do and loving others. Again, I love what Tom Schreiner says about this. He says, the best way to discover your gift is not by taking a test. He says, they didn't have such instruments in the early church, and people discovered and used their gifts just fine. He says, rather, if you get involved in the lives of others in your church and love as Jesus commanded, then you will discover your gift. So what happens? What happens when we live this out? What happens whenever we do what, what Peter is calling us to do as we are wanting to glorify God with the time, with the days that we have left, as we are waiting on the return of Christ? We need to understand that all of this glorifies God. All of this glorifies God. You see, as you are waiting on the return of Christ, and as you are loving others, as you are helping others without complaint, as you are serving others with the spiritual gifts that God has given you, this glorifies God. Look at what Peter says. He says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, when you love others, when you help others without complaint, when you serve others with the spiritual gifts that God has gifted to you, we need to understand that God is glorified. We need to understand that all of this brings glory to God. Why do we do this? Because what Peter is calling us to do sometimes can be difficult. Why do we do this? I, I want to remind us this morning as to why we do this. We do these things that Peter is calling us to do ultimately because Christ calls us to do these things. We do these things because Christ loves us. We love each other because Christ loves us. We love each other and overlook each other's offenses and defaults and, and faults. And we show forgiveness to each other. Why? Because Christ forgives us. We do this because Christ died for us. We do this because Christ overlooks our imperfections and he, he fills us with his Holy Spirit. 
We do this because Christ empowers us by his spirit. We do this because Christ has commissioned us and allows us to join in on his great work. In closing, I want to say this, that one day we'll see Christ, whether that's by his return or whether that's in death, but one day we will see him face to face. And one day we're going to ultimately see how loving others and helping others and serving others was worth it. It was worth it. Look at what Jesus himself says. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer to them, truly I say to you, As you did it to one of the least of these brothers, you did it to me. You see, as we do what Peter's calling us to do, by above all, loving one another earnestly, overlooking each other's faults and imperfections, by helping each other without complaining and using our gifts to serve each other, to serve the church, to serve The world, whenever we help another human being, what the Bible tells us is that we are ultimately serving Christ. Would you pray with me this morning? And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're in this place this morning or you are with us online and you're listening and you're participating and you're wondering about this thing called Christianity. You're, you're wondering what it means to be a follower of Christ. You're, you're wondering what it means to have the, the hope of Jesus Christ. Well, I just want to explain that to you this morning. The Bible tells us this. The Bible tells us that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible also tells us this, that that one sin That one sin is enough to separate us from God for all of eternity. And the only way that we can have the forgiveness of our sin is by placing our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ. That's it. You can't earn your forgiveness. You can't buy your forgiveness. You cannot be good enough for your forgiveness. The only way to have your sin forgiven and And for you to have the hope of eternal life is by placing your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us this, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean? That means that you have to come to this realization that that you are a sinner. And that without Jesus Christ, that, that you are hopeless. And then you place your faith and your trust in the finished work of Christ. What is that? That's that story that we talk about at Easter it's that, that Jesus Christ, he came to this earth and he, and he lived a perfect and a sinless life. And then he, he went to a cross and he died on that cross for the forgiveness of your sin and for, for my sin. And then he was placed in a grave and then he was resurrected from the grave three days later. It's placing our faith and our trust in that finished work. It's calling on him to save you. And this morning you can do that. And you can have that hope. You can have this hope that we're talking about today. 
And whenever you call on the name of Jesus Christ, the, the Bible tells us this, that you are sealed by the Spirit. This means that His Spirit comes to live and to dwell inside of you, to empower you to do what Peter is talking about, to, to serve others, to love others, to give up your life for others. And this morning, you can pray a prayer like this, and you can mean this from the depths of your heart. God, I understand that I need you. I understand that my sin separates me from you. And I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. I trust in his finished work on the cross. And right now, I call on the name of Jesus Christ to save you. I place my faith in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of my sin. I can... Mit my life to you from this point forward. I, follow, I want to follow you. And the Bible says this, that if you said that to God this morning from the depths of your heart, and you believe that in your heart, that the Bible says that you are a Christian, the Spirit of God now dwells inside of you. And there is a, a next step for you. If you're watching with us online or you are in this place this morning, the next step for you is to tell someone, to talk to somebody about that so that we can show you just the steps that you need to take as a follower of Christ because the Bible says that after we profess Christ as Lord that we are to walk into the waters of baptism and to show the world that we are followers of Christ. The next step for you is, is to be baptized. So therefore, would you, would you tell someone so that we can celebrate with you, so that we can explain to you about what baptism means? God, we love you. Thank you so much for this word today that we were able to see in Peter. God, you remind us so often in your word that the end of all things is at hand and that the next, the next thing for us, what we are waiting on ultimately is the return of Christ. At the end of the book, Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, I am I'm going to return. And we are waiting on your return, Father, and we are asking you for your return, but Father, as we are waiting on you, God, help us, God, to depend on you in prayer. God, help us to love others by the power of the Spirit dwelling inside of us. Help us to, to help others without complaint. Father, help us to, to serve each other. Help us to serve the church. Help us to serve, God, the world around us with the, with the spiritual gifts that you, God, have given us. But Father, help us to do these things not for us, not for our glory, not for the glory of Lake Central Baptist Church, but Father, ultimately for your glory in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ because to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. God, today we turn our eyes to you. We look, our, we look to you. Father, we want to serve you. Father, we want to worship you. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We love you, God. We love you. We love you. We worship you right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Church family, would you stand to your feet? We're going to sing a song of worship back to our Savior. Devin, would you lead us?